this region. This is, of course, the Lito shipwreck, which had these very well-known gold objects on it as well. So by the 9th century, certainly the area around the Singapore was well-known uh, to the Arabs, as well as the Chinese, the Persians, and it was attracting quite high quality. The, the most um, extraordinary quality of things that were being produced on Earth at this time. And of course, that's found off Lito, which is on the sea lane between the South China Sea or the Straits of Malacca and the Java Sea and the, and the Borobudur, for example, the great Buddhist monument which is under construction at exactly the time when the ship sank around 8.30. Now, one of the things I got asked to do, if you go to the Maritime Museum, you'll see me on the wall <laughs> spouting off about the Blito cargo. <laughs> Uh, the, the display that's in the, the Sentosa Museum is why is this relevant to Singapore? Why, why did it have any um, meaning to have Singapore to get the shipwreck? What was going on around Singapore? Well, we don't have any evidence of anything going on in Singapore in 830. But 40 kilometers west of here we do. Just 40 kilometers away, there's this island called Karimu. And that's where it is. It's a fairly large island, which is like the cork in the south end of the Straits of Malacca. You can't go out of the Straits of Malacca or into it from the south without being seen from this island. And it's been a Chinese navigational landmark at least since the Tang Dynasty. And this is the north tip of that island and it's got an inscription on it which is in Sanskrit. And it's using these kind of characters here known as Nagari or Deva Nagari script which is used in the Buddhist Mahayana monasteries in places like Nalanda in Northeast India. And it says, Mahayanika Goliam Trita Sri Gautama Sripada. That's all. <coughs> Which can be interpreted as Mahayana. So this is, of course, the Mahayana Buddhist. The Mahayana devotee. Um, and then because of the word order, so the Mahayana devotee, whose name was Gautama, again named after the Gautama the Buddha, um, he was a possessor of a round instrument, a gola yantra. And these are his footsteps, padma, like pedestrian. This is an old uh, um, Indo-European root head. And so these are there are these little indentations on the rock, and that is probably what they made out to be his foot, footprints. So Gautama, in this case, was a Mahayana Buddhist. He was not the Gautama. He was not the Gautama. <coughs> But he was, uh, he had a round instrument, and he lived somewhere around here, which is now a big quarry used by Keppel Corporation. But they left the hill. They did, they did leave the hill preserved, very fortunately for us. And that is probably what they meant. And in fact, there are third, fourth century Indian texts which do refer specifically to armillary spear as round instruments, gola yantra. So this guy on this island, he was probably a Sri giant chief who had obtained one of these Goliantra somehow, either from a passing ship or because it was a kind of a, a gift given to him maybe by the Maharaja Sri Jaya. And so the Singapore area definitely was strategic and it had a literate population who were able to acquire things like very rare navigational bronze instruments. So at least the Singapore area was certainly not just a backwater at this time. Now these are the modern people who still live around there. They are one of these groups who are usually just known as sea nomads. They don't call themselves Malay. And in this place they call themselves the uh, um, Akit people, or an Akit. And they still live basically um, on the sea. This is the view from the rock here across all the islands here. They claim to be Buddhists, and they claim this is their Buddhist shrine. There's nothing whatsoever in it. So, they say they conduct ceremonies according to the phases of the moon. No anthropologist has ever gone to study that. I just went there to visit once to see the inscription and found these people living there. And they were still actually looking after this because you can see the inscription actually has a little wall around it now. They built the wall and they still decorated with flags, just like the Orang Laut Sea nomads in Singapore were said to be doing with a stone at the mouth of the Singapore River in 1819. There was a stone at the mouth of the Singapore River. The sea nomads who lived in the Singapore estuary were worshiping that stone the same way as these people are. 
Okay, but just 500 kilometers south of us, if you go due south, you will come to the kingdom of Malayu, very important. Um, but they, all the artifacts you find here basically date from the 11th or 13th centuries. Very interestingly, I'm sure there are more of an earlier phase, but so far we have not discovered any Tang dynasty wares at all in the Batanghara area, whereas in the Palamba area, many, many uh, Tang wares of various types have been discovered. Tambi, and it's still a center of traditional boat making today, beautiful ships constructed, and there was a center, unlike Palamba, we still can find lots and lots of brick ruins. Lots and lots of foundations of stupas, for the most part, it was again all Buddhist, and we have this very beautiful Parsnaparamita statue, so again we can say the Vahayanas. These other Makaras, these um, nomadic monster figures guarding the entrances of the temples and so forth. In 2005, we got a, a grant from a Singapore company called Orchard Marine. And um, they, that allowed us to do a survey along the river looking for other kinds of sites besides temples. Looking for actual porcelain for the most part, because we can date the porcelain very clearly. We still can't date Malay pottery very well. But Chinese wares, of course, we can find it. And so this is going along the river banks, just scraping back the river banks to see what you could see revealed in those riverbanks. So there had been some kind of slight changes in the river courses. We found lots and lots of Malay type pottery. Paddle marked, paddle marking is one of the main techniques that identifies Malay pottery, basically taking a carved piece of wood, digging it on the surface of the clay, and creating this type of decoration on it. The same, well, I did my PhD dissertation on this site here called Kota China, Chinese Fort in Malay, which is also a Song Dynasty site. How far back the name goes, we don't know. It was first recorded in 1825, when there was no Chinese fort <laughs> in Northeast Sumatra. So the name obviously dates back much earlier, and that's the kind of swamp where Fort Achim is located. So these two types of pottery, some with this kind of incising, others with that pedal marking, these are typical of what one can say is essentially Malayo Polynesian style pottery. There are lots and lots of different kinds of decorations, almost identical to things we find here in Singapore. Same kind of techniques, same kind of motifs. Now, the word uh, Kota China, Chinese fort, is almost echoed precisely by Marco Polo. As he says, when they came through in 1292, they got as far as the north end of the Straits of Malacca, and they couldn't go any further because the wind changed. And there was, a, there was a thing. Somewhere in the Straits of Malacca, you get as far say, as Straits of Malacca from China or from India, depending on for the northeast or southwest. But then that's as far as you could get. You couldn't get from India to China in one monsoon. You'd have to stop off here. And so if they were like Chinese, and they're coming in a large fleet already at this time, they would stop off and build themselves a stockade. In other words, it doesn't seem like there was a permanent Chinese settlement yet where they would have stayed. They wouldn't have had to build a stockade if there already was one. So Marco Polo says they had to build themselves their own stockade, and they stayed there for five months to defend themselves from the local cannibals, who are probably a reference to the Batak people. So this is, a this is the frontispiece to the first English translation of the travels of Marco Polo, and they chose to show them actually passing through the straits. And here's the Ache. Here's a little Malay village here watching the big UN dynasty uh, ship sail by. So this is no doubt what the other site known as Kota China was. Okay, now the Malay Annals um, are the oldest source we have for some kind of a story of how the Malays themselves like to present their own past. And of course it was collected by Sir Stanford Raffles, probably when he was in either Penang or in Malacca, because it must have been before, well it was before he went back to England in uh, 1816. So sometime between 1805 and 1816, he picked up this manuscript, which gives the date of 1612 for its composition, which is a genealogy of the Malay rulers and court ceremonies. And it was written when the Malay kingdom was based up the Johor River. 1612, the Malay capital was up there at Batu Sawa. And so Singapore was kind of at the mouth of the Johor River. It's, uh, it was right around this time that Singapore was actually um, obliterated by something, we don't know what. 
Uh, but anyway, it starts off the story of the Malay kings. It traces back to Alexander the Great, his Kandar Zulkarnain, his Persian incarnation, who conquers India. And he was a Muslim, by the way, if you didn't know. <laughs> he converts the king of India to Islam. And he married the king of um, India's daughter. So we had this Persian, Greek, um, Indian combination. And uh, they had a son named Raja Shula, who became the second king of, of this kind of Islamic India. And he had a son who confusingly is named Raja Chula, almost the same. And he wanted to try the Chulan, having conquered India, wanted to conquer China. But uh, so he set off on the way uh, and stopped off at Tamasic of all places, which is Singapore. But the Chinese had heard that he was coming, and they knew they couldn't defeat him in the battle, but they had a scheme. They had a cunning plan, as Black Hatter would say. And so they sent a boat, which was a boat ready to sink. The masts were rotting, the sails were all full of tatters, and it was crewed by old toothless, hairless men. You would think, why would they do that? Well, they got to, they got to Tamasic, they met up with uh, Raja Chulan. Raja Chulan said, how much further to China? And they said, we were 20 years old when we left. <laughs> so you can keep on going, but you'll be 100 years old by the time you get there. So he stopped. He didn't go further, he stayed in Tamasic. But it's interesting, Tamasic showed up, first of all, at this, again, it's the junction between the Eastern and the Western Oceans and the Malayan Alps. The Indians and the Chinese meet at Tamasic. So instead of going on, he, he, he descends into the sea, he makes himself a glass box, and he goes into the ocean. He, he dives, he becomes the first maritime archaeologist somewhere around Singapore. We still not allowed to look for this ancient kingdom under the water. <laughs> they don't allow us to dive in Singapore. It might be still there. Um, we could find the princess who used to rule the Sunder Sea Kingdom. Somewhere between here and Batam, no doubt. And uh, he had three sons with this princess. And eventually he got homesick, went back to India. He disappears from the story. No doubt he was Raja Rajendra Chola. Rajendra Chola was the king of South India of the Chola uh, Empire in the year 1030, which is when they conquered Sri Vijaya. So this is a thinly despised reference to the Chola invasion of 1030. Now, chapter 3, we get the reference to the hill in Palamba, Mugazagutam. The three sons somehow got tired of living under the ocean and come down on this hill in Sumatra. And so they have the three sons, and uh, this is signified by this legend where the two widows living on the hill, they planted dry rice on the hill of Saguntam. And they saw, they looked like their fields were on fire, and so they hid under their bed all night. And they got up the next morning, and... Uh, their, their rice, the rice grains are turned into gold, and they're grading the stalks into silver. And then these three uh, shining young men appear on the hill, and so they made the, 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 the eldest one the most prestigious position. He, be out, he got to be the king of Minankaba, West Sumatra. The second one, the middle son, he got to go to Borneo and be king of Borneo, Tondopura. The third one, who's named Sang Leo Utama, you know, Sang is actually kind of the honor him for a young kid or something like that. And they don't call him uh, um, Sri, they call him Song. So he was the youngest, he got to stay in Palambang. So they made him the king of Palambang, and they gave him the title Sri Tri Buana, Lord of the Three Worlds. And uh, so this is supposedly, as Gilles will know, the grave of Juan Malini, or is it Juan Mpuk, I can never be sure. One of the two widows, anyway, supposedly is buried on Bintan. It's actually probably a 15th century tombstone, in you know, Chinese style. But this now become, uh, according to local Rion legend, the grave of one of these three, these two widows here. So, Sri Tri Buana, now we call him that, you know, the Lord of the Three Worlds, he eventually got bored living in Palambang, and so set out to found the city. He eventually first went to Bintan, where he met the queen. So the Singapore area at that time was ruled from Bintan and was ruled by a queen. Uh, but she didn't have a husband, so she said she heard that this uh, somebody was coming, a king was coming, and she said, if he's my age, I'll marry him, but if he's too young, I'll just adopt him. She was older, in other words, she was again senior to him. So she adopts him as her son, and then she invents the Malay Nobak in order to make him the king. So 
I learned in Malay lore, of course, the nobat, the nine instruments, uh, are, which is a Persian term, actually are the regalia which you must have to become ruler. So according to this legend, they came from the, the Singapore area, from Bintan. So he went out hunting one day, and he got up on a large rock, and he looked across the water, and he saw this land on the other side. And they, he asked, what's that place over there? And the, the, his friends tell him, that's, that's called Tomasek, your highness. So he sees Tomasek, and this is a quote from the Malayan Isles. Looking across the water, he saw the land on the other side that sand so white it looked like a sheet of cloth. That was the kind of the emblem of the supreme whiteness of his textiles. And he asked Indra Gopal, which is one of his partners, what's that place over there? And Indra Gopal said, that's Tomasek. And so Sri Tribwana was attacked by this beautiful white sandy beach, because there aren't any on Bintan. And he says, let's go over there. And so they go over there. And then they decide to found the city. Now this is the cricket club. This is where Sri Tribwana landed, obviously on Tomasek. How do we know? We excavated and we found the white sandy beach. We didn't know it was there. We had no clue. We were looking for 14th century artifacts. So under the padang, at the edge of the, the bowling green, and here, here's the, the stratigraphy, very nice stratigraphy. You can see it starts off with the colonial period up at the top. That's more or less built by the British so they could play cricket up here. Then you've got the various other layers of sterile soil going up to the soaring stuff, which is sterile, no artifacts in there. Then you've got black sand here. That's stained black by all the human activity. It's full of 14th century artifacts. That whole thing, a very thick layer of 14th century habitation. And underneath that is what was there before the 14th century, white sand. Beautiful white sandy beach. So this is a totally unexpected indication that they were not making up the story. There was a white sandy beach which was still remembered in 1612. But by this time it already turned black. <laughs> you couldn't see it anymore. But this is one of the several motifs in the Malayan Isles that keep on trying to say we didn't make up the stuff about Singapore. If you go back and see the remnants of this, you can go and see the place where the Prime Minister got turned into stone in the mold of the Singapore. And you can see the, the red soil where the, where the um, Muslim was executed by the King of Singapore and so on. They keep saying, they don't say that anywhere else in the Malayan Isles except Singapore. They keep saying, if you don't believe me, you can go and see these things that are still there. So this was a, quite a surprise to us. And so then, it, so then he went ashore on the white sandy beach, and he saw strange animals. Red body, black head, white breast. Rather bigger than an eagle, if you can imagine that. And nobody could figure out what this thing was. And so they eventually decide maybe it was a lion. That doesn't sound much like a lion. But they say, okay, let's call it a lion. So Singapore becomes Singapore. <laughs> now, you want to see all these cartoons, you can go to Fort Canning. They're actually up on Fort Canning. They're posted up there. They tell the story of the Malayan Isles in these cartoons by, done by the famous Malaysian cartoonist Lot. So he built Singapore, he ruled 48 years, and Singapore became a great city. This is the first great Malay city, according to the Malayan Isles, is Singapore. Um, and so Sangi Lutama changed his name to Sri Tri Buana. Tomasek changed his name to Singapura. In both cases, he changed from Malay to Sanskrit. It's a branding exercise. <laughs> <laughs> they were changing from a local language into an international language. They were making themselves part of a greater sphere. They were entering into the kind of worldwide network of trade, which is mainly the South, um, South Asian seas at this time. And then they were buried on the hill of Singapore. All these famous figures in the formation of the Malay culture buried on Fort Canning. So it's very explicitly. Uh, so he ruled for um, 48 years, supposedly died 1347. How do, we, how do we get the date of 1299? There aren't any AD dates, obviously, in the Malayan Elves, or Anohijor dates either, for that matter. There are no dates at all and the Malayan Isles. So how do we figure out 1299? Well, if you take the five rulers, there were five rulers of Singapore in the Malayan Isles, and uh, they, 
totally rained for a, a period of 114 years. The last one of the five was named Iskandar Shah. Iskandar Shah was real. We don't know about the other four. Was there anybody? So we know there were people, who, there were lots of people who had the, the title Sri Sri Bwana, a very common one, including the queen of Java in the 14th century, Sri Sri Bwani Shwaratuna Dewi. Very common title in the 14th century. Um, so there was probably somebody in Singapore who was called Sri Sri Bwana something or other. But these other ones, Paduka, um, so on and so forth, Paduka, Sri Sri Kwarama, we don't know for sure, we don't have any historical sources that confirm those three middle period. But the last one, Iskandar Shah, we met the Chinese. The Chinese met him. Chang Ta records meeting him. So he existed, but he was in Malacca by that time. So at least we can say that uh, Iskandar Shah died, according to Chinese records, in 1413. Count back 114 years, you get 1299. We tried to have a celebration in 1999, 700 years. Nobody wanted to believe it, <laughs> unfortunately, so we didn't get to do it. So then we get the stories about Matarapad and Majapahit in Java, sent envoys to Singapore. And of course, we do know that uh, Singapore was being fought over by two empires in the 14th century. And the Mayanels are full of the uh, rivalry with Majapahit, who supposedly uh, destroyed Singapore in about uh, 1400. But we also know from other sources, and principally Chinese sources, that the Siamese were also attacking Singapore in the 14th, early 14th century already. We have Chinese sources that go back to 1320, which already referred to the Singapore area. So it seems like Singapore was very strategic, but also vulnerable. It was right at the junction between the mainland and the island spheres of influence. Both the greatest mainland empire, Ayutthaya, and of course, those are the ruins of Ayutthaya, which is the capital for 400 years um, before it moved to Bangkok, and also Majapahit and East Java. They were both claiming suzerainty and probably extorting money from Singapore in the 14th century. And we have found little bits of both uh, Thai artifacts, which of course Cheryl and Logan have written about. I've read that in a, um, a paper and as, a, as an article published on the Thai, the Thai pottery. If you didn't forget that, right? <laughs> and also, I mean, we've also found some Javanese type items, such as this little terracotta figurine head, which is like the very famous one from East Java. So we do have indications of connection to both Siam and, uh, and uh, Java at this period. Then we get the story about Badda in chapter 5, the, the strong man of ancient Singapore, the Hercules of the Malays. He had, he had, he became uh, incredibly strong by eating demon vomit, as it says. <laughs> and so the king of that time, Sri Rana Vakirama, made him the war chief. And one of the feats of strength they did was he threw this rock from, from Bukit Singapura, which is no doubt Fort Canning, down to the Tanjong, the point at the Kuala, the point at the mouth of the river. 